Welcome to Tunis International Radio for the Sunday edition of the English Language Program with the maestro Murad Sili on the technical engineering side and I'm your host Adnan Shaweshi. I'd like to thank Murad for Petit Marie, one of the best songs. Today my guest is Dr. Salah Haneshi, one of the first graduates from American universities. He graduated in 1979 from Columbia University in New York with a PhD in management and quantitative analysis. Dr. Haneshi is a former diplomat in Japan and Australia, chief executive officer of the Agency for the Promotion of Industry of Tunisia, API, Dean of ESG, Institut Supérieur de Gestion, the Graduate School of Management, Chairman and CEO of Bourgeois Science and Technology Park. Dr. Salah Haneshi is founding member and co-chairman of Sahara Solar Breeder Foundation International. I'm expecting your questions and feedback on my Facebook page, FTCE, the English Language Program. You can listen to the live streaming on FTCE, www.rtc.fm. Stick around, we'll be back. Welcome back, it's 206 on our radio station and my guest is Dr. Salah Haneshi. Dr. Salah, welcome to FTC. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. I haven't seen you after such a long time. Yeah. <laughs> welcome to FTC, Thank Dr. You. Dr. Salah, reading your resume is a real challenge. I will just let you introduce yourself because it's not easy to choose the right terms. Well, <laughs> you have introduced me very well, but maybe what I could add is to say that mm -hmm. I am born in Janduba. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I am... Uh, well, in Janduba, we call ourselves the Far West, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I am born on the River Meleg, uh, mm -hmm. which is the border between Janduba and Kef. That my swimming until I was 13 was really in the river, and whenever <laughs> I cross two, two or three, uh, I find myself in Kef. And then you moved to, to New York. <laughs> and, and then I did my school, my high school, in, uh, at that time there was no lycée in Janduba when I got my uh, Concours de Sixième, so mm -hmm. I studied in Beja. Mm -hmm. So I concerned myself, I grew up in Beja, I fell in love in Beja. So, mm -hmm. so the I people of Beja. <laughs> Beja, and I like Beja too very much. So. Dr. Salah, it's amazing how you traveled to the U.S. and graduated from one of the best universities in the world in the 70s and you decided to serve. Tunisia abroad as a diplomat, an advisor, and a specialist in different fields. How did, why did you choose to come back? Oh, well, I was often asked this question was uh, when I was in New York. You know, as we, you know, I'm very happy that you considered that my school is uh, one of the good, best universities. In the world. Actually, in the Shanghai ranking, Columbia University ranks seven, mm -hmm. so it's a good school. It's still one of the best. And, and I was working, when I was doing my degree, my PhD degree at Columbia, I was working mm -hmm. at uh, Wall Street, so I'm making good money and I was making a good living. But somehow, I felt like I needed to return. From and Wall Street? <laughs> yes, I used to work. Back to Tunis. Yes, I, I didn't work. Uh, I was working for the training program of some banks. Mm -hmm. I worked uh, for the training program of Chase Manhattan. Uh, for uh, that, uh, Chase Manhattan then filled with the chemical bank and now it's called Chase, just mm -hmm. Chase, two banks are mm -hmm. called, and I worked, it was really, a, and I also worked for Fidelity, First Fidelity in New Jersey, mm -hmm. for quite a few banks as a, you know, they had training programs and I took advantage of the fact. A very you short resume. Extra money. Huh? You have a very short resume. Yeah. <laughs> so I worked also with that, so, but I always thought that I needed to come back to Tunisia. And Why? I remember that many of my friends in, uh, in New York, say, why, mm -hmm. why are you going back to, what is the area in Tunisia that you're going back to? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to say, so I said, well, it's like uh, Odysseus or Ulysses, once born, mm -hmm. you know, on the Mediterranean, you go back to the Mediterranean, but uh, I was very, always wanted to serve, and I hope, I thought that uh, going back to Tunisia would help me serve. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of opportunities, you know, I don't know what I did the right thing when I think about what some of my other colleagues are doing mm -hmm. in the U.S., but um, I, I think I had an exciting uh, life, so I don't regret uh, having come back. Mm -hmm. Doctor, do you think our youth have the same mentality? Uh, are they willing to come back after graduating from uh, American or European, or European universities? Well, some are, 
But what I tell some of my, uh, you know, friends or my younger, mm -hmm. you know, mm, you know, followers, or I mean, I tell them, look, from wherever you are, you can serve Tunisia. Mm -hmm. In modern times, with the modern way, modern ways of transportation, of communication, mm -hmm. you can be as good, in, uh, as good a Tunisian and as good a patriot. Mm -hmm in the U.S. or wherever you happen to be as you are in Tunisia. So uh, just make sure that uh, you are in the place where you can do your best, the, the best, mm -hmm. where you can uh, f blossom to your full potential and for the good of the country where you are staying and uh, also for the good of Tunisia because I believe in you know, uh, not win-win <laughs> situation mm -hmm. where, you know, we can help, uh, you know, uh, uh, our country for where we are by developing good relationship mm -hmm. between the country w where we are staying and, uh, and Tunisia. Doctor, uh, as a former diplomat in Japan, how would you describe the Tunisian-Japanese relations before and after the revolution? Well, <laughs> it's a long story. Well, I think that the Tunisian-Japanese relations have always been an even keel. I know Tunisia is one of the first countries to have established relationships with, with uh, Japan and actually very curiously uh, mm -hmm. Tunisia and Tunisians are the only uh, people from the Arab world or from the African world who do not need a visa to Canada to mm -hmm. go to Japan very often uh, very people mm -hmm. many, many people some it's even some people from uh, you know Saudi Arabia or Egypt the or Gulf region Gulf region or even from Europe they, don't, they need a visa but we don't need a visa in Tunisia you can go from to Japan. You know the historical background. Sorry? You, you know the historical background. Why we don't need a visa? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I just uh, no. I don't know actually. I'm, I'm curious to know. But uh, <laughs> from the time Japan at, at one point in time, Tunisia uh, had uh, such a good image and uh, did not need a visa with so many countries. So mm -hmm. that uh, Japan, which usually benchmark its uh, decisions uh, with countries on number of countries mm -hmm. uh, and so we then uh, did decided that they did not need uh, to have a visa with Tunisia. So Tunisia until today can go to Japan without a visa. You don't need a visa to travel to Japan but we need a short break with music. Yeah. Enjoy. We'll be back. So this is actually the Schengen. Sunny came home, a very nice song to welcome Dr. Salah Haneshi and his wife Dr. Lin Haneshi. Dr. Salah, as a former ambassador to Japan, State Secretary, State Minister at the Ministry of International Cooperation and Foreign Direct Investment, Dean of the Diplomatic Course in Tokyo and Dean of the African Arab and Islamic Diplomatic Course in Tokyo, you have promoted the bilateral relations and you have brought important Japanese investments to Tunisia. We would like to have an idea about this yeah. exceptional effort, which well, was okay, basically a group effort, yes, and, but you have you. contributed to this. Well, let me tell you that there is also one other unique relationship between Japan and Tunisia. Mm -hmm. uh, Tunisia is the only African and Arab country mm -hmm. which borrows both from the governmental financial market mm -hmm. and also from the private capital market. From the government, you know, the, the what is called the ODA loans, official development aid loans, or the exim bank loans. These are political decisions which are made by Japan to help countries in a way uh, which is what you may call grandeur by ODA. And this, many countries have access to these uh, facilities, you know, to ODA. But Tunisia is the only one that has an annual relationship mm -hmm. Uh, an annual uh, agreement contract to borrow money from Japan at very, very interesting loans, very interesting terms. Uh, we borrowed money to build the bridge, the Radis yeah, Bridge. Radis we bridge. borrowed money to electrify the uh, train between Tunis and Hamamlem. We borrowed uh, for the telecommunication, for dams. We even took advantage of the uh, COP3 at Kyoto, the Conference on the Environment, in which it was decided that the countries which would 
build uh, uh, reforestation can borrow at very very interesting mm -hmm. uh, terms because it helps reduce the uh, uh, gas, greenhouse uh, gases such as CO2. Mm -hmm. So we borrowed loans like at less than 1% mm -hmm. over 40 years with 10 years of grace. But these loans we are the only with Morocco, the only non-Asian countries to have annual agreements with Japan on this. But there is another market which is called the samurai market, which is the capital private market. Samurai market. Samurai market. Which Tunisia is the only African and mm -hmm. the only Arab country which can borrow from the samurai market. N not South Africa, not Nigeria, mm -hmm. not Kuwait, not... Mm -hmm. I hope it will stay because uh, what, what earned that uh, the earned us uh, this uh, access is our good signature. Tunisia mm -hmm. has been, until today, yeah. has always been paying its uh, debt on time. Mm -hmm. And this earns us uh, a very, not only a very good you know, image with the decision makers, but also mm -hmm. with the bankers. And so recently, fortunately, we have now two private investors, such as mm -hmm. Yazaki and uh, Sumitomo, Yazaki in Gafsa. Uh, there were some problems on the occasion of the revolution, but fortunately, Yazaki was understanding and they maintained their decision and to stay mm -hmm. in Tunisia. I personally invited uh, Mr. Yazaki himself to Tunisia uh, around 2000, I think 2001 or 2002, and he was very happy to see mm -hmm. you know. And we have Sumitomo, which is in Bila Regia, which is also making a big investment in Tunisia, and so this is really, I hope, the beginning of a great interest uh, in, uh, uh, from Japan in mm -hmm. the private sector. Dr. Haneshi, uh, Madame Sian Ben Sedin was here. She was the guest of uh, my colleague Nurjin Shevch, and she told me that she traveled to Japan and she talked to uh, Japanese officials uh, who said that they were willing to work on a Marshall Plan mm. uh, for Tunisia, but they mm. need a clear vision from the Tunisian government. This is great news. I, mean, I didn't know about this, and I'm very happy that to hear this. And I very much like to meet Sihan Ben Sedin and to talk uh, to hear her about this. And maybe I'll talk to the ambassador of Japan. Mm -hmm. Indeed, uh, Japanese are very, very interested in Tunisia. Not mm -hmm. only because they are very, uh, like everybody else, very happy with the, what happened after the revolution, and very happy with the way it happened, as compared to the mm -hmm. way it is happening somewhere else. But even before, Tunisia has always, uh, Japan has always considered, looked at Tunisia in a strategic way. They have, they have always said that in Tunisia we have three dimensions which are very interesting and mm -hmm. of great interest to us. There is an African dimension, and Japan is very, very interested in Africa. Yeah. It's been held, uh, holding summits with Africa long before many other countries started holding summits. Mm -hmm. Back in 1993, Japan held TCAD. Tokyo International Conference on African Development, which has mm -hmm. been convening regularly every five years and will convene next year in Japan in June. Uh, and so this is a, a signal of their uh, uh, interest in Africa. And they consider that Tunisia could be really a platform for triangular cooperation, mm -hmm. say family planning, in many other fields. And so that uh, then, of course, there is a Mediterranean type of dimension in the proximity to Europe and the relationship with Europe, the access to the European market, and also, of course, the Arab uh, uh, dimension. So for all of these reasons, and also Tunisia has a, a very positive image in, Tunisia, in Japan, and I'm sure that after the revolution, the image is even more positive. And so I think there is indeed a great opportunity for thinking strategically, mm -hmm. not simply, yeah, you know, mending, you know, uh, small, uh, occasional problems. Mm -hmm. Dr. Salah, you have too many friends in the business industry in uh, Japan. How do they evaluate the current economic situation in Tunisia? Mm. <laughs> well, I've been away from my Japanese friends now. They are, so I haven't, <laughs> but I'm sure they I haven't have had a chance to hear them. Well, actually, what is interesting is that recently they were visiting in Tunisia and from their point of view, mm -hmm. they say, we don't think the situation is as bad as many other uh, countries. Or Japanese countries. are very optimistic. Well, no, 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 no. Japanese are very... Realistic. Uh, realistic and very cautious. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also, they have ways of looking at things. They look at the, you know, the, the trends, the, uh, uh, the long term, and, uh, uh, and they think that is what is happening in Tunisia is in somehow normal mm -hmm. and that uh, 
uh, they are very impressed by the fact that uh, Tunisia continues to serve its debt regularly, mm -hmm. and this is very rare. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, you know, we take it for granted because we are used to it, but uh, I remember once when I was uh, at the Institute, uh, ITES, the Institute d'Etudes Stratégiques, I had a visit from British Gas because we were thinking about doing uh, a study on energy, 21st uh, mm -hmm. century energy. And uh, they told me that they were very, very happy to be in Tunisia. I said, why? I said, because we receive our payments on time. I said, well, is this a big deal? <laughs> I said, yeah. Well, they know it's not the case we know other the world. from other, for other countries, including important countries. And they specifically mentioned uh, Russia, mm -hmm. where they do not the because the system is not well organized or whatever it is, the bureaucracy is not well organized or there is some reticency or it is not a priority or it is not of the culture. But they were very impressed by the fact that Tunisia pays its services that well. Mm -hmm. And this was what earned us a rating that allowed us to access to the samurai market in Tunisia, the first global samurai which was issued by Tunisia in Tokyo. Which means global samurai, that means it's a, a bond uh, mm -hmm. uh, don't issue which you borrow money, mm -hmm. but from which to which investors from the U.S., from Switzerland, from Europe can participate. That is the first global samurai ever for Japan. It was issued from Tunisia, all thanks to this. And the Japanese know this culture in Tunisia, and they think that this is a long-term mm -hmm. thing. It is not. It's a cultural thing, and I think that this will continue, and therefore they are uh, more optimistic about what will happen in Tunisia. And they, you know, with this long-term view, they, they they think that on the contrary, Tunisia will be a very good partner, and I think uh, we should absolutely take advantage of this uh, offer that the Japanese are. And fortunately, I mean, you know that what situation the Europeans are in financially. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have, yeah. and so, and uh, we cannot really uh, count only on the even, on the though, our, our, even though they are our. Partner, first partners. Our first partners. Uh, General de Gaulle says you can ignore history, but you cannot ignore geography, and geography makes it such that Europe is our first partner. Mm -hmm. But Europe is now very busy with Greece, very busy with Ireland, very busy with Spain, very busy with many countries. Yeah, too many problems. And so it is even the Europeans who will very uh, welcome somebody like, or some country like Japan, mm -hmm. which will help stabilize a country which is in their immediate neighborhood and which if it becomes unstable will become a big problem for Europe and mm -hmm. if it becomes stable and succeeds in uh, the democratic transition will become a big example for Europe, for the neighboring countries. Thank you for your optimism, Doctor. We will just mm -hmm. have a short break with the music. Stick around, we'll be back after the news update. Enjoy. Welcome back. It's 2.36 on our radio station and my guest is Dr. Salah Hanashi. Doctor, welcome back again. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor, how do you evaluate the current economic situation in Tunisia? Improving. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm saying this seriously while saying it in a provocative way, but mm -hmm. I'm saying this seriously. You can look at the numbers and the numbers are improving, but you also can look around you. You mm -hmm. see that uh, things are more you know, uh, picking up activities, you go to the Medina and you see that tourists are coming back, mm -hmm. not to the degree that we all want or wish, not to as fast as we would like, but uh, I think uh, the economy is picking up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm saying, you know, we, we went through a revolution. I mean, a revolution is a revolution is a revolution. And it is not an intifada, it is not uh, a revolt, it is a revolution, by all standards of a revolution. But, you know, uh, what is the major standards? Is the, the values, the change in values by which a country lives. And there has a very major change of values mm -hmm. has taken place in Tunisia. If you look at the, the mentality of the young people, the desire of young people to serve, the mm -hmm. freedom that we all feel around us, uh, the debate that you feel, I mean, sometimes there is an exaggerated, I mean, it's an abusive take 
of the freedom uh, that we all enjoy today, but that is very normal to mm -hmm. all these excesses. But so by all these standards, it is a revolution, and when you have a revolution, you do have to pay the price for mm -hmm. the revolution. I think uh, if we uh, take the number, I think the price is we have a, we are getting a very good deal. I think the, where the challenge is in that the young people are there is a very large number of unemployed people and, mm -hmm. and unemployed young people uh, and unemployed young graduates from the university and uh, I think uh, they have become demanding and impatient but what they consider to be the revolution and so and unfortunately uh, and, uh, this, really need, this, this needs to be said mm -hmm. uh, even a double digit number uh, a growth rate of the economy will mm -hmm. not meet the very high expectations of these young people. So we have to find a way of first talking to them mm -hmm. and find you know emergency solution while waiting for long-term solution to take place. So this is uh, uh, what I, I think about uh, mm -hmm. the economy. Doctor, since the revolution Tunisia has been through about socio-economic crisis, what priorities should the government consider in order to avoid a worsening situation? You know, I think it's uh, for a very big challenge for Tunisia to have engaged uh, on both, you know, and this was actually uh, on a double track, you know, mm -hmm. and, and this was uh, uh, reflected in the campaign. Uh, when you I remember in the electoral campaign before October 23rd, when uh, you heard people campaigning, Mm -hmm. You didn't know whether they were running for governance, mm -hmm. current governance, you know, management of the current affairs of their country, mm -hmm. or whether they're running for a constitution. So we had this double challenge of, you know, uh, making a constitutional assembly or electing a constitutional assembly for the for constitutions, but at the same time addressing challenges of government of employment. Etc. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think it would have been nice to have a separate separate tax where you'd kind of like a consensus, a national union uh, effort on the constitutions. Mm -hmm. The constitution is not, it's like, you know, a game uh, of soccer. The rules of the game are not an object of competition between the two teams. Mm -hmm. The two teams should have a joint effort, or the three teams of the teams on the... Do on the, on you the think they have a joint effort? They have to, it should have been right from the beginning, independent from the, you know, uh, the opposition mm -hmm. government, political, political process. It is an unusual and extraordinary political process that should have been separate, completely separate from the governance process. Mm -hmm. Where everybody, again, is like teams in a football game or in a soccer, soccer game or in a volleyball, agreeing on the rules of the game. So this is not the object of, should not have been the object of competition. Mm -hmm. And we should have, and so we cannot talk about opposition and non-opposition within the Constitutional Assembly. But unfortunately, the Constitutional Assembly and the, the governance the body are the same. This is the reality. But if I had to make say, I say that the employment is really a very youth employment and maintaining, especially I think, finding a way of maintaining the enthusiasm of young people for their new freedom and for their new mm -hmm. enthusiasm for civil service and for public service. Mm -hmm. Doctor, earlier this week, in spite of the security challenges in the Middle East region, Qatar invested 18 billion dollars in the 18? Egyptian 18 billion mm -hmm. dollars in the Egyptian economy. Is the hesitation of the European, American and Arab investors related to the security situation in Tunisia and shall we expect more investments after the upcoming elections, the 2013 elections? That's what we hope. Yes, we hope so. Uh, but uh, again, it is necessary mm -hmm. but not enough in the sense that uh, Qatari uh, capital, or other capital, that comes from countries such as Qatar, is not. Uh, we need investments, mm -hmm. and money is not investment. Yeah. And, and so we need to work with countries, European countries. Mm -hmm. We need to work with American 
the United States. We need to. I'm very happy that two days ago we had uh, Brazil, yeah. which is a new new game. Brazil never looked. We at were Tunisia. also celebrating National Day of Brazil here on FTC. And they had also what is very interesting, and they had a seminar, a joint seminar between the office of the president and the office of the chief of government on mm -hmm. the uh, new type of economy, economy, uh, social and solidar economy. And they had a very interesting experience in the way they, for example, uh, they uh, created the linkages between local economies and local schools, etc. Mm -hmm. But more than all of this, it, that now Brazil is interested in Tunisia. That's really that is a new thing. China is interested in Tunisia. Japan has always been interested and has confirmed recently into its interest by offering to a Marshall Plan. And so the United States, you know, I remember I had a friend, you probably know her, Lisa Anderson, mm -hmm. or Eva Billen, and I used to guess about her, you know, how we can build strategic, you know, years ago, uh, with the United States. Uh, you know, Tunisia is small, is not uh, mm -hmm. for Tunisia. Well, now Tunisia is strategic. It's not a country, US. it's the country. Now Tunisia <laughs> is the name. Uh, the is other day, the on the same radio here, I was listening to an interview with uh, somebody, a Tunisian-American, who was run into the trial thorn. Mm -hmm. Karim, and he said he participated in the trial thon in, uh, in in the in New York, and he was very happy to hear the name of Tunisia in eleven languages. So this new visibility should not just be a subject of pride; mm -hmm. it should be put to contribution to face the challenges, the very daunting challenges that uh, Tunisia faces, but which uh, are not by any means insurmountable. They will require patience. They will require sacrifices. They will not meet the expectations of the impatience of the young people, but mm -hmm. uh, I think Tunisia is on a good track. Doctor, uh, I'd like to move to higher education. You were dean of the ESG, Institut Supérieur de Gestion, the Graduate School of Management, chairman and CEO of the Bourse Cédria Science and Technology Park, and you held other positions. How do you evaluate higher education in Tunisia? Because you know that our universities have been ignored in the recent ranking of universities. Uh, we don't exist in the eyes of the world. Is it because we don't have the means or the skills to invest in scientific research? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, you know, let me first say that it is not just Tunisia which does not figure Mm -hmm. on the uh, Shanghai, the famous Shanghai ranking, you know, the first university which ranks, uh, which appears on the Shanghai ranking uh, is a uh, French university which appears on the, is, appears on the 46th or 51st rank. So mm -hmm. not many universities and uh, very... Second, let me uh, tell you that uh, in some areas, you know, when we send Tunisian students abroad, they do very well. And I'm here to, 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 to um, well placed to know, because we have initiated a very important uh, exchange uh, program with uh, Japan, and uh, we send about 30 students about mm -hmm. uh, four years ago. Uh, it, you know, I grant you they were among the best, you know, because there was a very yeah. uh, severe uh, selection process, but. They went to universities like Tsukuba University, which has three Nobel Prizes, and 15 of them were there, and they all participated on an equal in the exams for the PhD program, mm -hmm. and they ranked first. Excellent job. Ranked first. They were for the Japanese. First in Japan. First uh, w uh, ranking with the Japanese. Now yeah, the Japanese. So, uh, this augurs well, but I think this is not enough. Because, and the first thing that we need to do is to, sh to change our conception or our vision or philosophy of education. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you an example of the, which shows the need for the exchange. When Borsedria technology, but you mentioned mm -hmm. the Borsedria, when it was created, it was the ENRST, Institut National de Recherche Scientifique et Technique, mm -hmm. because it wanted to concentrate on applied research. And there was very, very, very strong opposition from Faculty de Sciences. Why? Because they considered that technical research and Isn't applied research are not important. They are not for <laughs> university researchers. And in turn, why? Because 
in the Latin Mediterranean culture to which Tunisia belongs, mm -hmm. the university is born either out of the mosque, out of the Zaytuna, mm -hmm. or out of the church, like in Milan or whatever. So it was really catechism which is externalized, which means that the conception is that the university, the teaching is to the service of knowledge, mm -hmm. the service of proving the existence of God, yeah. or the unicity, proving the unicity of God, or maybe proving the sex of the angels, mm -hmm. but not in the service of development. So applied yeah. things are not very important. If you look at other schools, mm -hmm. non-Latin schools, non-Mediterranean schools, if you look at Anglo-Saxon schools, if you look at American schools, if you look at German, German schools, the school is in the first place in the service of the sector to which it belongs. It's really technical, vocational training of a very high degree, very, you know, higher not higher education, a higher vocational training. <laughs> so that uh, they serve, for example, in the US, the, the University of Idaho, has to teach one semester course on the Idaho potato. Not on food, not on potato. One Idaho hey, potato on one semester course. Because mm -hmm. for the services that it receives from the state yeah. of Idaho, it, in return, it helps, it contributes in a very concrete way to the development of the competitive advantage of Idaho, which is based, who's, the, economy, the economy which is very centered around mm -hmm. Idaho in particular. Yeah. And you, you could, the Bursadria, for example, is in, uh, even though it is an applied thing, it has no one doing research on parsley, even though parsley is cultivated about eight kilometers away in Surima. It has nobody doing research on uh, uh, oranges, mm -hmm. even though it is about eight kilometers from, and it belongs to Nebel, the active uh, Bursadria is not in the Belarus, it is in Nebel, yeah. but it does not pay at all until now attention to the practice. Do you think, Doctor, this is a problem of budget? No. It's or a, mentality? It's a, no, it's an orientation, it's a vision. You know, we are, you know, again, this is what I was trying to say, mm -hmm. is that uh, we think that education is to make a gentleman, mm -hmm. to make a well-educated person, maybe to serve the truth, to build, to contribute to knowledge accumulation. Mm -hmm. And that is, and the ultimate, of course, uh, term, uh, it helps development, but it is not in the immediate service of development. No, for example, we did not create an engine. What we should have done when we got independence is create a lot of engineering schools, not faculty de sciences. Mm -hmm. But we created a need only very late in the 70s. Do you think this was a strategic mistake, Doctor? I think so. I mean, I don't. Ha I hate the word strategic mistakes, but it is very so surprising it's that it's a country which is about to develop. Uh, things about faculty de science makes you know people who think of physicists, you know, things about the cosmos, about the phenomenon and, and uh, phenomenon. Why do you need engineers? But w w when we need engineers, <laughs> when we need vocational, uh, you know, electricians, mm -hmm. plumbers, mechanics, engineers, and we had our engineer school only until today. We have a very, very strong deficit in engineer training. Mm -hmm. Maybe this was the problem of the vision of uh, President Habib Bourguiba back in the, no, uh, think, in the 50s no, and but the 60s. When you look at, you know, it is not Habib Bourguiba because when you look around the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. it's a cultural thing. You find that oh, Algeria okay. does the same thing, Morocco does the same thing, etc. All Mediterranean countries, they faculty de science because they think that university is for science, for knowledge, not for development. This is again the problem, but the major problem. Which is wrong. Well, no, no, it's not wrong. You know, it Also, development in science, of course, knowledge in the ultimate you know, uh, reason, we will serve, but we need engineers, but mm -hmm. we don't have schools of engineers. Yeah. Doctor, the, uh, and not, what is yes, even yes. great is that now engineering schools try to be like faculty decisions. <laughs> Copy and paste. Because <laughs> the people from the uh, research, the scientists from the faculty de science and from the, make fun of them. You're not real professors, you're not real researchers. Mm -hmm. When you have to do fundamental research and theoretical research, if you do apply to research, you're not considered to be a true, yeah. a very good researcher. Doctor, I'd like to ask you about Desert Tech. Desert Tech? Yes. <laughs> well, as you know, you know, m many of your uh, uh, listeners know that there is a, this big initiative 
desert tech, which is to use the Sahara Desert to produce energy for Europe mm -hmm. and for the Maghreb and for Africa and for the world. And uh, this is a German initiative, actually it's a Club of Rome initiative, but mm -hmm. German uh, companies and German universities and German decision makers have embraced the decision, make it uh, wholly embrace the decision. And of course, at the beginning, the, the focus was on Algeria because Algeria has the Sahara, the biggest uh, share of the Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were out of the game in some, somehow. And then, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Moldi Miled, who's the fondateur of Desert Tech Foundation, mm -hmm. we thought how we can be part of this uh, big initiative. And so we thought of creating a Desert Tech University network, which ha which proved to be a great idea because this is now the probably one of the most active uh, components of Desert Tech. Uh, it helped us uh, build a relationship with uh, Wuppertal, with many universities in Germany, with the Space Agency in Germany, mm -hmm. with the Research Center, uh, Fraunhofer University uh, Research Centers, and many Arab and MENA universities from Morocco, Algeria. Uh, Mauritania, uh, no, maybe not Mauritania, Libya, uh, Jordan, Egypt, Syria, many, many universities, in Lib uh, Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Doctor, uh, I would like to ask you about Sahara Solar Greater Foundation mm -hmm. International. Could you just give us an, an answer in about 40, 40 seconds? Well, it's the equivalent of Desert Tech, but uh, initially Desert Tech, both of them you know, were a response to what to do to the challenge, the climate change challenge, mm -hmm. and to the uh, energy global energy challenge. And one was Desert Tech from a German initiative, basic originally concentrating on concentrated solar power, the technology, while the Sahara Solar Breeder is on photovoltaic. But now they are closer and closer together. But mm -hmm. the social thing is one initiated by Germany uh, and the Club of Rome, and the other one by Japan. Doctor, uh, the US government is providing $10 million for scholarships. What's your advice to the students who will land in the United States in the coming years? Yeah, I think. They're we probably listening. They are probably listening. Yes, I hope they are listening. Uh, I think we should have, uh, we should prepare for their return very carefully. We should not wait until they uh, have finished their studies to start working with the universities. We mm -hmm. did something similar in Japan, which we call TJAST, uh, Tunisian, uh, Tunisia Japan uh, annual uh, symposium on science, on science society and technology, uh, but we really prepare the university so mm -hmm. to work together and then we send the students to the university so the professors between Tunisian universities and Japanese universities know one another they work together they have joint research projects and so the students when they go they are working within an environment which is in a way made ready for them they know what themes mm -hmm. they are going to work with relevant both to Tunisia and to Japan and I think we should do the same thing take advantage of this program this ten million dollar program to establish a contact between Japanese uh, American universities and Tunisian universities as researchers from both Tunisian universities and, uh, and American universities work together. So when the students go there, mm -hmm. they just go and meet. Yeah. Mr. My message to these young people, come back. Come back? <laughs> well, you know, we say, you know, with remote, remote nationalism, you can serve your country for wherever mm -hmm. you are. Keep your country in mind. Thank yeah. you for your optimism. Georgia on my mind. <laughs> Georgia Tunisia on my mind. Tunisia on my mind. <laughs> Keep Tunisia you. on your mind from wherever you are. And this yeah. would be uh, very helpful for you. Dr. Salah Hanashi, thank you very much for coming. I'd like to yeah, thank yeah. the maestro Murat Sili for his technical assistance. Join me next Sunday for another additional English language program. Next, news update in French and the German language program with Ulfa Khmiri. Until we meet again, I'm your host, Adin Shewishi. Stay tuned to RTCI. Bye-bye. So now she can pick up on desert tech.